All right, all right, everybody. Welcome to um, the the second of two webinar Wednesdays that I had today. This morning I had a great webinar with our friends over at Ring Central, and this afternoon we are going to be focused on IGIL and how you can be secure as a remote worker, and the endpoint shouldn't matter. And I have two great guests with me today, and uh, you know, on the phone with me I got Carl. Carl, you want to take a minute and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. You bet, Pete. This is Carl Gersh. I am the Senior Director of Marketing over at iGel. Um, prior to iGel, I spent quite a number of years at Citrix, so I'm a former, uh, former Citrite. Uh, very focused on marketing and technology related to end user computing. Cool, and thanks for joining us today. And then Chris, you want to give yourself a quick intro? You and I go way back. So. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so Chris Feeney, I'm the Channel Sales Engineer at iGel. Um, been here just about two years, but uh, have known iGel for uh, probably about six to seven. Um, started that when I was at Improvada for over a decade. That's where I met Pete. And uh, excited to be here to talk to you about the remote work opportunity that we have today. So thanks for having yeah. us, Pete. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Pete Downing. I'm the Chief Marketing and Technology Officer of Zentegra. Carl, Chris, and I go way back. Uh, we all either met each other while working at Citrix and then Chris and I met each other working at Improvod and, and Chris has a great background in healthcare and uh, and Improvod. So if you ever have any questions on that, he's your man. So um, as far as uh, house, a little bit of housekeeping today, we are using GoToWebinar uh, and there is a awesome Q&A dialogue. We encourage questions and, and we will give you hopefully good answers. Uh, so definitely if you have any questions throughout the day today, uh, please put uh, your questions in the Q&A dialogue and we will field them as they come in and I you know depending on when they're asked I might even interrupt and say hey Carl or hey Chris I got a great question so definitely ask questions as we go through the content today um, so the goal is simple uh, I'm gonna give a quick introduction and have a couple polls the polls kind of help us understand the, the folks on the call uh, and some of the problems you guys are facing today especially today uh, and then I'm going to jump into the IGEL uh, side of the house and let Carl run and, and start driving a good conversation. And Chris is on deck to show off some cool uh, stuff that IGEL has been doing over the last uh, six months or so. There's a lot of cool stuff that he, he's going to show us today, uh, depending on how the conversation goes. Um, if, you go, if you haven't already, uh, please uh, bookmark this page. It's zentegra.com forward slash webinars. Uh, we have a lot of great webinars coming up uh, in the next you know, few months. I got, uh, we've had webinars with Ring and we highlighted our MSP last week. Uh, upcoming, we got Liquidware, uh, Nerdio, and a couple other great vendors, Control Up, uh, coming up on deck. And I'm building out that schedule fast and furious. So keep an eye out on the site for net new webinars. And also, if you haven't, bookmark this page, zentegra.com forward slash events. And this will, this is where we post all our, workshops and online trainings that we host uh, on a weekly, uh, sometimes more, and you definitely wanna check that out. There's a lot of great new events uh, coming up on uh, in the next few months. And they are all virtual, by the way. And then finally, zentegra.com forward slash podcast. If you love podcasts, Andy, our founder and CEO, does a great podcast called The Citrix Session. He highlights a blog and posts it, and they, co they have a conversation with the uh, author. So, Three great resources. Definitely recommend bookmarking those. All right, so a couple polls uh, so we can lay the groundwork for uh, you know the conversation a little bit later. So I got a first good solid question, and I'm gonna pick one out of my little box here. Uh, how would you you would how would you and you being the one deciding this rate your remote work strategy today and it can be from your point of view it could be what your boss thinks but again these are anonymous and uh you give an answer that you think fits your current state today we're gonna give this a couple seconds and i love seeing the results as they come in and the more people that vote the more data we get and again it is totally anonymous so don't worry And some of the Zentegra folks can even vote if they want and tell us how we're doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are gonna uh, jump in and going once, going twice, and share the results. 
All right, so we have a, a pretty good spread here. We got a lot of folks falling on the upper end, I'll say. Uh, there's a bunch of folks that say, hey, we, we're excellent. We're fully enabled. I'd love to reach out and talk to you guys about use cases and how, how things are going as far as uh, your day-to-day -day, uh, and what you think is making your work ex your remote work experience awesome. All right, so let's uh, get to the next question. And uh, just making sure everybody's on. And let's, uh, I'm gonna ask, do you currently, do you have, currently have users leveraging a cloud only scenario? So do you have users that only access Citrix, only access VMware, only access SaaS based applications? Uh, and, and you know, this is very simple, yes or no, right? And you know, if you have a mix, answer for the majority, right? So if you have 80% of your users that do this, the answer yes. If you uh, if you're 50 50 then i would say you know maybe no <laughs> and maybe i should but i wanted to keep it easy yes or yes or no so that way it's black or white and we'll give it a couple seconds and again a totally anonymous don't worry going once going twice and three times and i'll share this so we got about a 50 50 right on the button so we got 50 percent of you saying hey i got users that access cloud only scenarios and we'll I'll, I'll we'll kind of cover why but the question i ask is then why are you running windows at the endpoint and chris and carl will talk a little bit about that as we go through the day today and then for those who are running you know don't then the question is well what can we do to help enable that use case whether you're using SaaS or vdi or session-based computing all right so let's ask uh, one more question uh what public cloud are you considering this is more of a fun stat just to see what's what you guys are looking at and again you know it could be microsoft azure google cloud aws a hosted private cloud or none you're still thinking about it and again pick the one that you're majority on so even if you do a mixed bag hybrid um pick the one that you are primarily on i'll give it a couple seconds i like watching the results as they come in All right, we're almost at 60%. A couple more answers. Going once, twice, and done. All right, so you know the stats don't lie. Again, 44% of you are are either on Azure or looking at Azure. There's a good chunk of you still on in the none bucket. So that's kind of interesting. It'd be interesting if, if you answered no. I'd love to circle back with you and find out. You know, what is your DR strategy? What is your business continuity strategy? So that'd be interesting to talk through. Amazon's still, you know, one of the big contenders, uh, but I'm actually seeing a big flip now over to Azure. And I find it interesting. We didn't get any Google Cloud Platform folks. So uh, interesting, but I love seeing these stats. So those are some of the polls we have, and I may throw one in a little bit later, um, but thanks for playing. And that helps us kind of level set on the conversation. All right, so if you're not already, please definitely give us a follow on social media, uh, any of the flavors, whatever, you, you know, pick your poison, pick them all. Uh, we're everywhere, and I try to post relevant content whenever possible. All right, so let's hand the controls over to Mr. Carl Gersh and Chris Feeney, and we're going to take you through, you know, IGEL and how you can make remote work secure and where IGEL is really fitting in. And I'm excited about this session because not only do I believe in this technology, but we use it every day in our office in Charlotte, and we have all our sales engineers on it as well. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand over to Carl, and Carl, I'll give you control as well, so you can uh, control the slide. So let me make sure you can do that. All righty. And I'm giving you keyboard and mouse, and there you go. So you have full control. All right, looks like it. Okay. So Pete, when we were, we, we were talking about doing this presentation, hold on, all over the place with control here. Um, yeah, let me start out by, you know, I gave a little bit of background, I give a little greater background. So, so academically, I studied economics and philosophy. That's what I got my degree in. I entered the technology industry about 25 years ago, but I still think that when I consider technology, I'm always looking at it sort of kind of from that, that lens that, you know, the technical philosophy business lens, um, and then the technology that follows. So for the conversation today, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be accompanied by Chris. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what the heck is going on and kind of dovetail into why I think IGEL is a really compelling technology 
and, and from like a business strategy standpoint first, and then from a technology standpoint second. So when I say what the heck is going on, obviously, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room as it were is that, you know, COVID-19, you know, global pandemic, but the reality is that what we're seeing is that we're seeing it's accelerating organizations' digital transformation uh, initiatives at, at, a, at an incredible scale, right? So, you know, I, I've said as, as this has gone on, you know, amongst folks that work in EUC, you know, I said that one of the challenges with COVID is that, you know, everyone's like, oh, we got to figure out a, a remote work scenario, and and we've been like, hey, we've been talking about this for twenty something years, right? You know that that you know it's it's you know suppressing that like I told you so, you know, type of, uh, you know, response is, is tricky because we've been discussing the benefits of remote work for a very long time. And we've been talking about the challenges if you don't kind of put a flat strategy in place, what could happen? We're, we're seeing that now, and I don't want to over-rotate on that, but I think it's interesting. Um, but maybe more interesting is that I want to start, I want to tell a little story, and I'm going to show you a slide, and, and this is an actual slide, I didn't make this up. I want you to imagine that you're an executive, the CEO has called you in, he wants to have a conversation about the state of the organization, and he puts up a slide, and this is the slide he puts up. And to make it a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna zoom in. But, oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. So he puts up a slide, and the slide he asks is he says, how can we get the organization to anticipate change and not always react to what's happening, right? How can we generate greater confidence with all stakeholders and lead our organization like winners? How can we create a more decisive, responsive organization where initiating action is a smooth reflex and not always an ordeal? I love that phrasing, you know, a smooth reflex. And how can we create an organization with fresh, liberated thinking, always seeking new innovative ideas to the challenges we continuously face? And finally, how can we focus our organization on evaluating the results? Now, if I said to you, like, if we look at this, this slide and we think about it, and, and I think the use of Comic Sans font gives some of this away, but if I was to pose the question to say, hey, when do you think this conversation took place? And at what type of organization? I'm gonna guess, well, you know, Pete, what do you think? Chris, you guys haven't, this is actually the first time you've seen some of this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say within the last, maybe a year, maybe two. Fair enough. Vinny, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, I mean, I've been for the last five years just sort of watching this, this whole, you know, cloud continue to grow. And, and I think certainly in the last couple of years, uh, particularly as my background from healthcare, I was like, when is healthcare going to embrace the cloud fully? I think, did anybody anticipate a pandemic type thing forcing the issue? Uh, but yeah, probably in the last couple of years as, as the cloud technologies began to emerge. Um, sure. That's, I think that's fair. So here's what's amazing. This slide, this is the actual slide taken from a 2010 presentation. And it wasn't a presentation given at a new media company or a healthcare company or a financial services company. I kind of gave it away a little bit. It was a presentation given at the third largest producer of packaged lunch meats in the US. And the company was called Lando Frost. And Lando Frost was coming out of the 2008 recession and from a management, an organizational management perspective was saying, hey, we need to think about how we can come up with a strategy to, to create resilience in our organization. And here's what they looked at, right? They looked at things like the volatility of the market, the uncertainty of the future, you know, how things were getting more and more complex, how things were getting more and more ambiguous. This was in 2010. And if we look at specifics right now, right, I would say that these generalizations are even more true today, right? We've got pandemics, sure. We have millennials, which, you know, as a parent of a millennial, I'll tell you is, is second only to the pandemic in terms of stress. Uh, we have geopolitical events like Brexit. Right, and we've got dispersed talent. People are not just flocking to cities to work. So as organizations move into the 20s, you know what I think we're going to see is that, that these the, the this new approach that Lando Frost Lunch Meets was 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 struggling with back in 2010 is even more salient and more important today. So I'm going to go on and say that you know, and I think these, it's not really a huge stretch. A new approach is needed for all organizations. I started working on this content actually pre-pandemic. And and as I was working, I was like, I was like, oh my God, like holy cow, like it, how is this, you know, even it's so much more true today than it was before. Because before I was talking about benefits, you know, if you, you know, everyone was forced into a new approach. Now, I mean, restaurants had to rethink their business models when no longer the the business model of having people sit at a table and eat dinner was was out the window. You know, restaurants had to think, hey, what's my new approach? And overall, you know, if we look at business. Here, here's here's what I, I'm going to go out and say. I'm going to say that. Right now, the world is becoming turbulent faster than companies are, are becoming resilient, right? Volatility is redefining the business environment. 
and today's best practices, right? Best practices were based on what we did before, right? We said, oh, that worked well before. Those best practices are manifestly inadequate. And, and, and we're seeing that today, right? Like the best practice about, you know, even, even like people coming into an office and badging go on printers. That was the best practice. Badging go on printers doesn't make much difference right now, right? So, so the only dependable advantage the organizations have is going to be a superior capacity to reinvent the business model before circumstances do it for you, right? And, and from that, you know, this idea of a strategic agility really should be a top priority for CEOs, right? So the organizations that we're seeing have be less impacted by COVID, and admittedly, everyone is impacted, right? But the ones that are less impacted were those organizations that we were thinking more of, we were kept classifying as sort of the, you know, the forward thinkers, right? They're, they're, they're out on the edge, right? Suddenly, they are the ones that are able to adapt to this, this change much faster than organizations that had kind of been waiting and seeing and, 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 and kind of holding, clinging to those, those old best practices. And, and there's a guy named Don Saul, and his area, he's a professor, he's a, a doctor. His area of expertise is business strategy in turbulent times. Um, he has a great book called The Upside of Turbulence. And, you know, what Professor Saul says, he talks about this concept of the fog of the future which requires greater focus on creating execution culture. And fog of the future, if I was gonna try and characterize what we're going through right now and, and where we thought we were eight months ago, right? I don't think anyone eight months ago had any idea we'd all be home today, right? You know, you can say, hey, come with, come, come with scenarios and, and no one was gonna say, hey, I think we're gonna be living in the walking dead, right? So, so the reality is, is that I can't tell you today, I, I think we'll get through this pandemic, but I can't tell you today that I have any idea what's going to happen in 2021. I mean, it could be the year the aliens actually show up. So what is going to happen for organizations is that if you want to survive, if you want to be able to move forward, you need a new mindset, right? You need to accept the fog of the future. You need to be able to accept the fact that we have no freaking idea what's coming. But that's okay because there is a way to come up with an organizational strategy that one of the basic tenets is be prepared for the unknowable. And, and if we can adopt that new mindset, I think we're gonna get, we're gonna see new results. We're gonna see you know, that resilience you know, that, that the organizations need. And this goes back to the folks of, you know, that, that over at, at uh, Land of Frost. Because what they looked at was they said, look, is there a strategy? Is there an answer? Is there something we can look at, a model that we can look at that can accommodate First and foremost, the fact that we need to be able to move quickly, right? That we need to be able to change direction, that we need to be able to accommodate late, late timing requests. And I say in that phrasing, because if anyone's ever worked in software development, you're gonna, and you see my slide right now, obviously, you're gonna know where this is going, right? Because there is a group of people that, that had to deal with this way before a lot of us, and that is the software developers, right? Because they sit down and start developing code, and, and as code became more complex, software projects became longer and longer, and what they found was you could sit down in year one working on an application for you know, BlackBerry and in year two find out that, hey, there's a new device called Apple and it is eating BlackBerry's lunch. So software development, the software developers said, hey, you know, our old model, right, our best practices of waterfall methodology, you know, are manifestly inadequate for the fast paced world of internet software development, right? And we need to come up with a new, a new strategy. And, and that strategy, that methodology was called Agile. And what Lando Frost kind of discovered and, and developed, and, and what I'm proposing is that if we look at Agile as not a software development methodology, but as an organizational strategy, what we're gonna find is that with very few tweaks, it does provide us with kind of principles and guidance and, you know, and, and its strategic direction, North Star, as to how an organization can be prepared to sail into the fog of the future. And, and, and I'm gonna like, let's look through just the four core tenets of Agile. And all I need to do is really change one word, in my opinion, to sort of make this point, right? So Agile, first and foremost, in, recognizes individuals and interactions over processes and tools, right? So like, again, I think most of you on this call, we're here to learn, we're all in EUC, but you know, this idea of, oh, let's do it the old way, right? Let's do it the old way, let's keep doing what we're doing, um, you know, is, is, is just doesn't work. Uh, you know, Don Sol, he, he talks about that, he calls it that active inertia. That's we keep working, just doing the same stuff you did before. And then, then when everything turns, you go, well, you just work harder doing the same stuff. And this active inertia you have to overcome. And agile is about overcoming it. That's that first bullet. 
The second thing is looking at working, now they said software, I'm gonna broaden that to results. Working results over comprehensive documentation. So in the, the run up to the call, I was talking with a colleague and we were talking about you know business strategists and I, I mentioned uh, um, uh, Peters, who has that famous quote we all like, right? Fail forward fast. Right? John Peters came out, he's like, fail forward fast. And we all, we all sing that mantra, right? And what did he mean by that? Well, I actually got to see him speak in the 90s. And, and the example he gave, which is two companies that aren't really around anymore, but he talked about MCI and, and, and British Telecom. And MCI embraced fail forward fast. MCI said, hey, you know, this is back when there's long distance. What if we gave him a program where you could say it was cheaper to call your friends and family? And they would roll that out in like, two months, eight weeks, from concept to version one. And then they would iterate for the next year. And when British Telecom acquired them, you know, one of the things that the, the CEO said was that at PT, uh, if they, they'd come up with the same idea at the same time, and they would take 12 months, workshop it, test it out, talk about it, have meetings, and so on and so forth, right? So this idea of, hey, let's get something out there, let's get it going, and then let's iterate on it is really important. And, and look, I mean, again, I think everyone's doing it right now. We're for, like organizations that had not embraced remote work are, are having to do so. That first that first poll question, I think, addressed that. Next, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Again, this speaks to flexibility. To so go back to the document and be like, all right, it doesn't say this in the documentation. This is what we're going to do on the paper. It, it contributes to you know this idea of active inertia. So going out there and understanding what's going on, right? Right now, one of the things I think is really interesting is that. You know, I, I equate what happened this year to sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We, everyone had to work from home and people like duct tape and bailing wire, right? To get everyone working from home. First goal was like, like it's raining, let's put a roof over our head. I don't care if it's a banana leaf. I'm in Florida, that's actually more valid, you know, structural idea than other areas, right? But, but the banana leaf, you know, the corrugated roof is only gonna work so long because then, then suddenly once you get that taken care of, right? Which I think where a lot of companies are right now, they're like, all right, we got this worked out. like. Everyone's going to VPN in and do all this other stuff, and and oh, it works. And then give it a week, and then suddenly everyone's like, this this works, but it it's painful, right? So so this idea of going out to users and 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 working with them and collaborating with them to figure out, hey, how can we make this, make improve this over the the rigors of a contract negotiation? I think is really important also. And the last, responding to change or following a plan. Like if anyone's thinking about a tattoo right now, I don't advocate it. Um, but any millennials, because I love tattoos, you know, that's be the tattoo, I tell you. That's, that should be your back tap. Respond to change or following your plan, right? Because that is, if, there, if, there's, a, if there's a creed that should evolve, that come out of all this, it's that that should be the number one priority for organizations. And Agile already defined it, and defined it back in 2001, right? So, so I think that, that there's a lot we can learn from Agile. We can look at that, and we're going to get into the technology. We're going to talk about how Agile supports that. But but I think, you know, overall, you know, my big idea here is that I think Agile gives us, you know, a very good framework, very strong principles off of which we can rethink business processes, because the reality is, is that information technology should support the business, right? It should help the business move forward, it should support the business. And if we get the business thinking differently, it's going to enable us to, 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 to give them better benefit. All right. Yeah, and, I, and just to throw a comment in here, so my background and prior to getting into the value added reseller spaces i used to run product teams and we had a we had a term it was called the minimal viable product and you know one of the terms i've been using lately uh is minimal viable deployment so what is the minimal viable deployment that gets something up and running that's going to be usable for the users and it's not going to necessarily be the end game but it's going to be good enough to get started and then that plays very nicely into agile where you can layer in the improvements over time and an ebb and flow based on feedback. And so that's kind of, you know, a term I've been I've been throwing around a little bit lately, especially when I'm talking to customers around Microsoft and Azure and Citrix and trying to go to cloud and you know all the different technologies we're hitting with uh Igel. Yeah, it's 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 really important. So probably at this point we're you know in the presentation, folks are going, okay, this is great. It's high level. It's certainly you've fulfilled your commitment to be philosophical, but let's talk what does this mean actually for end user computing? Right. And and I think that as we look at how end user computing needs to support the agile business, I'm going to I'm going to hone in on four key areas I think are really, really important. So first, end user computing needs to be flexible, it needs to be robust, it needs to be adaptable. Right. Pete asked a question earlier, he put the poll question up, which cloud are you using? Right. So Microsoft was, was came in first at 44 percent, but that means 54 percent of the people are looking at other clouds. And the reality is, as this technology evolves, 
being able to select the cloud provider, the workspace that is going to work best for your use case and your organization is really important. So end user computing needs to have that flexibility to be able to support whatever workspace, it, you know, whatever cloud you want to use, right? Next, it's got to be financially feasible, right? We all, we all work in technology, you know, and, and admittedly, I'm sure that budgets have loosened up a bit uh, with everything going on, but the truth is, is that every year we're asked to do more for less, you know, give us more capabilities, more features, more functionality for, for less money. So the financial feasibility is really important. It'd be great just to give everyone a fat pipe right to their house and they don't even need to, you know, we just set up a whole private network, but that's never gonna happen, right? So financial feasibility is critical. It needs to be highly secure, right? Okay, I like, I mean, enough said on security, but, but the reality is now when everyone's working remote, you know, as, as your, your threat fabric has increased exponentially, right? You can't lock, there's no network to lock down anymore. So every single point of light out there, as it were, um, you know, needs to be secure. And then, and then kind of in the same lines, it needs to be manageable at scale, right? Again, it used to be like, hey, everyone's on the same network, everyone's running on the same device, you know? So, so manageability at scale kind of came to this idea of uniformity. Uniformity is, is going out the window when suddenly everyone's at home on a different type of network, on a different type of device, you know, probably multiple devices, things like that. What does that mean for, you know, from a management standpoint, for the organization to be able to manage that and be able to make sure that the, you know, the company keeps, keeps up and running? Right. So these are the four, I think, four core tenants for, you know, and there may be others, but four core tenants that EUC needs to address to support the agile business. So in a surprise to probably no one, IGEL is actually incredibly adept at addressing those four areas. But let's start with talking about what IGEL is, right? Because IGEL is oftentimes associated with being a thin client and you know, our, our tagline, we are the next gen edge OS for cloud workspaces. And that OS part is, is so incredi incredibly critical. Um, and, and, and I'm going to tell a really quick story because I think operating systems to me are, it's a point of interest. It's, it's really fascinating. There's a phenomenal book that came out in, you know, 20 years ago. I can't believe it's 20 years ago. But the sci-fi author, Neil Stevenson, who happens to be a big geek as well, wrote a book called In the Beginning Was the Command Line. And he starts the book out by talking about 40 years ago, right? So let's go to the early, you know, late 70s, early 80s, right? He says, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had this really weird idea that they could sell an information processing machine for home use. But the business took off and, you know, the, those guys made a ton of money and they're, you know, considered visionaries and they get a lot of credit and they should. But he makes a comment, he says, but at the same time, Bill Gates and Paul Allen came up with an idea that was by far stranger and more fantastical. They came up with this idea that they're going to sell a computer operating system. And here's the thing is that that's a, like, if you, if you stop for a minute, that is a much weirder idea, right? Because at least the computer has sort of some sort of physical reality to it, right? You take the computer out, you plug it in, you don't know the computer, you see lights blink, you hear noise, right? It's a thing, right? What's an operating system? Right? What is an, oper an operating system? There's no tangible incarnation of an operating system. It's a bunch of zeros and ones, which when installed and coddled properly, allow another bunch of zeros and ones to talk to a machine layer, right? And sure, it comes on a, on a disk, and I, and I was looking, I had a floppy disk around here somewhere, I was gonna show it, right? But the floppy disk is just a box, right? That's the box, the zeros and ones come off. So somehow, in 1980, Bill Gates and Paul Allen came to this idea that you could sell a bunch of zeros and ones, and you could productize it. And that's like, like, come on, that's like, that's like saying, hey, we're gonna sell breeder reactors for people's homes, right? We're gonna, we're gonna convert, we're gonna productize, you know, U2 spy planes. But let's look. And he wrote this book in '99, you know, you know, and he, he talks about Windows 95 and the launch of Windows 95, an operating system that that Microsoft sells the same way Gillette, from the good old town of Boston, sells razor blades, right? You know, a new, uh, you know, Windows, a new version of Windows launches, and it's like a Hollywood blockbuster. The Rolling Stones played a concert for Windows 95. So, you know, it was, it just, it's, you know, that was, and that was 15 years later, right? And the market for operating systems is vast enough that people worried about whether or not they're monopolized. And even the most technically, least technically minded folks, like my dad, has a hazy idea of what an operating system is. You can ask anyone, hey, what's an operating system? They go, I know. Most of them, they don't, right? They think of all the applications that come with the operating system, like Minesweeper and Calculator and whatever else. But they all think they know what an operating system is. And, and they, they have opinions on the, the merits of operating systems. 
and they kind of understand, you know, like, you know, that if you have an app that works for Mac, it doesn't necessarily work on, on PC and so on and so forth. So, so that's interesting because I think that, let, so let's take this idea of this operating system. But the, the challenge of the Windows operating system is that it was designed initially in, in the early 90s. And it was designed for a computing environment in which, you know, your computer was, it was, it was distributed computing, you know, large and in charge, right? So it was an operating system custom built for distributed computing. And over time, Microsoft, you know, has, has evolved it. But the truth is, is that they're late, you know, it, the, you know, as I said before, people think of an operating system, they think about the presentation layer, they think of the windows, right? They think of the apps. Microsoft sort of kind of figured out, hey, we gotta abstract that and we gotta put that in the cloud because that's where things are going. We're seeing that, right? Such has been saying it for 20 something years, but like everyone's kind of caught up now, right? That that your workspace, we're not gonna call an operating system anymore because that gets confusing. So we're gonna call it a workspace. Your workspace is going in the cloud. I promise you, if not now, you know, in the next 10 years, it's going in the cloud. But it raises a question, okay, great, it's in the cloud, but what's on the device? What's on my thing that I'm holding that I'm gonna to use to access that workspace? And sure, you could put that fat Windows operating system on there, but that was not what it was designed for. But there's an operating system that was designed for this new this new paradigm. I shudder when I say paradigm, just being a marketing person, we get to overuse that word a lot, right? And that is the IGL OS. IGL OS was designed to be the edge OS for cloud workspaces. And that's what we're all about. And we'll talk about how you can get it, right? Because you can buy the software, right? You, you install it. You can get it on devices, and we'll talk about that. But but when we think about where IGEL, the context of IGEL is that the world is moving to cloud workspaces, and the reality is is that if you're going to go to cloud workspaces and still run a big fat operating system on your 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 devices, then you're really missing out on you know a lot of the capabilities and features. And and fundamentally, you're going to lose some of that agility that is so critical to be able to be successful with this fog of the future. So. A little bit of detail here on on IGEL OS. We just we have a, a new version, uh, version 11. IGEL OS is a Linux-based operating system, and our focus is around three sort of core ver core virtues, right? Make it simple, make it smart, and make it secure. And I think it's this focus on simple, smart, and secure that allows us to address those needs that we heard as it relates to what EUC needs to do to support an agile business. So. First and foremost, we talked about the need for robustness and adaptability. So I don't care which cloud, which workspace you want to work to. I don't know if it may be one that's coming out, right? Here's what I'll tell you. I'll tell you that there's going to be an IGL OS, you know, as an endpoint is going to support it, right? So you can connect to Citrix, you can connect to Citrix on-prem, connect to Citrix in the cloud, VMware, you know, we see Azure there, you know, Azure WVD, you know, or Citrix running in Azure, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, doesn't matter which cloud that you want to attach to, you know, we give you the flexibility to do that. Do you want to attach, are you home? Are you at the office? Are you in a coffee shop? Are you using different devices? Again, IGEL OS, IGEL OS as an operating system gives you flexibility to put that operating system on the device that you want to use, right? So it's not like, you're not like, I mean, we shudder. We don't like when people call us a thin client company because what comes with the concept of thin client is an embedded OS. And I get the thin client, the OS is on there and that's how I use it. And that's not how you use IGEL. IGEL is an operating system that you can buy and have it pre-installed on a thin client, or you know, again, we'll talk about it. You can put it on your own thin client, or you can run off a, pocket, a USB, right? So it gives you not just the flexibility to connect to any cloud workspace, but it also gives you that flexibility for whatever device, whatever location, whatever network you're on to be able to be able to connect, right? So I think we check that box for that that flexibility. You know, we talk about this idea of sort of an adaptability from a robustness standpoint. I'm impatient, so I keep clicking and it keeps jumping ahead, right? Just because it's an OS and it's a thin OS doesn't mean that we don't have a robust ecosystem. So built into IGEL OS is over 80 embedded technologies, right? So you're using Plantronics headsets, no problem. You improvise a Badger Go built in. So out of the gate, you know, you're not just buying some, some, some thin client with nothing, right? You've got printing capabilities, you've got analytics, you've got communications, Obviously, you got your workspace presentation. You know, you've got you know hardware support and and security. So so adaptive. We talked about flexibility, robustness, and adaptability. And I think that's where you know again, as an operating system, as an edge operating system, we're able to check those boxes. We're the only ones, in my opinion, that can do that. We talked about how. So so that's kind of the the, the virtues kind of of the agile operating system. So now let's talk a little bit about you know how do you get it right and 
and there's multiple ways, but the one that I think people like to talk about, and, and it's really cool and very, very unique, is, is our UD Pocket. So UD Pocket is, you know, it's the key, it's, you know, I say it's like the fast, easy, you know, workspace access, right? Because UD Pocket is our entire OS running off of that USB stick. And what's cool about that, there, Pete's got one right there, I got mine here, right, is that you can run your, Chris has got one of the old ones there, so right, so you can you can take this UD Pocket and and if you're on a Mac or you're on a PC and you don't want to convert the entire device over, you don't want to install iGel OS on that because you're running Windows and maybe you've got those games that you're playing tonight or you know your your personal things on there, you plug the UD Pocket in and suddenly you've got a complete secure Edge OS operating system running right off of that UD Pocket. So you know I worked at Citrix. We talked about BYOD. I think Citrix is very robust and they have a great BYOD program. But the reality is, is that you then, if you're running the app, you're running receiver off of your fat client, you're going to inherit by nature some of the challenges that come with that. So the UD Pocket makes it very, very easy and very simple for people that want to use their own personal devices to still have a kind of standardized experience. And as an IT administrator, you can control and have access to those, you know, to the the the, the pockets and the uh, the OS. So it really provides, I think, the best of both worlds, right? It gives you a read-only workspace environment that is controlled, that can be deployed on any device. And, you know, again, we'll talk, you know, it's less than $200 from, so we'll talk more about financial feasibility. But from a cost standpoint, it, it's very cost-effective. And again, like, name another OS you can run, like, off of, I know it's going to be a challenge, the tech guys will come back with me, I'll talk about, like, some Debian that you can do with, like, no drivers or whatever. But, you know, name another OS you can run off of a uh, USB like that and 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 be able to deliver that that workspace right so for a lot of our clients that are that, that have people that are now having work from home you know the ud pocket to us is a really really straightforward solution that makes it easy for the end user i mean it's i want to say it's stupid simple but i wrote the instruction manual um for a client when i was doing consulting for how to use ud pocket it was literally like step one insert ud pocket step one turn off computer step two insert ud pocket you know step three turn on computer and then hold down one of these combination of keys and then log in Right, it's 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 that easy, and and that ease of use. Again, let's think about it. everyone's working from home, and you do not want to have to be dealing with you know 500 people working from home giving you 500 support calls because suddenly they download a weird Windows update or you know they opened up that cute card they thought was there from their their cousin with the, the kitten hanging on the branch and suddenly they got malware. Right, so UD Pocket makes it really easy for for deployments at scale, especially when it's a dispersed audience, um, and it supports you know VPNs if you want to do VPNs. Um, and you know, browser and, and the like. And we're gonna do a demo of sort of the UD Pocket environment in just a sec. Hey, uh, Carl and Chris, a good, good question just came in. Uh, and there's another good comment. I gotta, I gotta scroll up, but I don't wanna interrupt you so I can read it, David. So I'll get to your comment as well. Uh, is the UD Pocket available in USB-C format? And, and, and I'm gonna say the answer is not yet, right, Chris? But it's something that's on the radar, but no commitment, but that, but is this a fair statement? It doesn't stop you from finding a cost-effective USB option and in, in flashing that, correct? Yeah, so two-part answer there. Um, a, it is not currently available in USB-C format as you see it on the screen there in the, in the slide. Um, there have been some discussions about potentially uh, getting a USB-C one, but uh, I, I'm not able to give any kind of time frame on that. However, to the second answer, uh, when this whole COVID thing kind of came out, you know, we did actually put out on our website, on our knowledge base, there is a way you can take a USB-C drive or any USB device uh, and, and, you know, convert it into a pocket. The, the difference here with the pocket is that it's not licensed based on the MAC address of the device you're plugging into. So I could take this and move it around and it's completely fine. If you go with that second option we talked about where I just need something real quick, and you get it booted up and you get it licensed, it'll be tied to that particular MAC address of the device you booted it up on. If you then take it and plug it in somewhere else, it's gonna see it as a whole new machine, right? So that's the difference. Cool, thanks, Chris. Um, I, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say one other comment too on, on some of this too, that the key thing, right, you can take and create a, you know, bootable stick with Debian or some Linux thing or whatever like that. The really key thing here that we'll focus on is the management of the endpoint. Uh, just before this, earlier today, I was on a call with with uh, one of the government agencies because I've been covering federal here at IGEL. And, you know, they're deploying these pockets 
and the end user is somebody that's very like you know medical you know focused and they don't want it to be a a, a burdensome scenario where them trying to figure out how to operate technology they didn't go to school for that they're they're focusing on saving lives and medical things they just want something simple and managing a device having everything ready to go that's really the key thing versus a long you know list they, they don't want 500 help desk calls as carl was alluding to earlier so yeah yeah i think it makes it it makes it very straightforward uh overall so UD pockets uh, incredibly popular if you would like one just reach out to chris or myself we'll be sure to get you uh, a demo pocket um, we like to share those out with folks looks like pete's got his stash as well so uh it's very good um I'm running low though all right well we'll make sure we hook you up so then also you know so the ud pocket we, we'll leave with that but let's also talk about the other ways in which you can you can purchase igel so the other is you can do a direct installation we call this conversion i personally am on a mission to sort of like change that language because i feel like conversion is a funny word it speaks more to hardware um the reality is we're an operating system. You can install our operating system on devices that meet minimum specifications. And what's really cool about that is it can be an old Dell Wise device, an HP thin client, or a personal computer, right? So, you know, Pete and I were speaking prior to this, to this, um, this webinar about, you know, just the need of, you know, like educational institutions that, you know, have to make this move, but it, obviously they don't have huge computer budgets, right? So, you know, they, they, want, it, they want to embrace cloud workspaces. They've got kids working from home. Um, you know, maybe they can't afford to go out and buy a bunch of thin clients, but they can convert existing hardware. And let's face it, we all know schools don't have the, the latest and greatest, you know, hardware, right? That some of them are probably still running, you know, whatever, 486s. I hope not. But um, so converting old devices using the IGEL operating system, turning them into a managed, secure thin client that allows you them to allows it, you know, the user to attach to a cloud workspace, um, you know gives a great user experience and it can save significant dollars. So when we do ROI analysis with clients, typically we'll look at as we look at that mixed environment of, all right, you're gonna buy a, you're gonna buy some UD pockets for this use case, you're gonna convert a bunch of these devices for this use case, and then you may buy additional thin clients for this use case. So that's that blended model that gives, I think, again, iGel tremendous advantage as it relates to trying to come up with, you know, what is our ROI? You know, when I when I was in consulting selling iGel, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm looking at Dell, I'm looking at iGel. I say, great, let's do a compare. Let's do an ROI comparison. Let's look at, but it's not just buying the device versus buying the device. We're not Best Buy, right? It's about, let's look at what are you going to roll out? What does the TCO look like? And what are the various use cases? And what, which iGel product are we going to slot in there to help maximize your investment? And then the third area is, is sort of kind of the, the, or the, the business that we've been in for a very long time, which is the thin client business. You know, I will say that, you know, my opinion is that iGel makes absolutely the most robust um, you know, best thin clients out there. We have multi, we have the UD2, we have the UD3. Um, you know, they come with, you know, a, a five-year warranty. And if, you know, it's the same way that Microsoft sells a service. If you, you know, need a device and you need Agile OS, you know, it's a, a great way to do that is to, is to purchase the thin clients from us. And, um, you know, it's still, it's a very healthy business for us. And, you know, I'm, some, some folks are kind of like, well, we want to talk more about the software. And I think the software is super exciting, but I don't dismiss the thin clients. You know, we've, when we would do POCs, we would always use, iGel because we knew that that would eliminate the endpoint as a point of you know you know issue as it related to a PFC. Trying to do a PFC for a cloud workspace, and you're going to use other you know equipment that's coming in. You you add risk to it, and then you know that sort of thing. So for us, you know, iGel gave us a, a very safe, secure, you know, high performance way to run PFCs. So it was sort of our standard. Um, and I know it, it's integrity. You guys are doing the same. So from a financial kind of standpoint, you know, I think that the um, you know the, this ability to do the 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 direct install is really important so with that said we talked a lot about the os we talked about how you can consume the os i think it, uh, what i'd like to do is is kind of hand over to chris and chris if you can kind of do just a quick demo sort of of, of the ud pocket and it's funny because i, I want to show this because a lot of times we'll talk to people and they'll be like kind of nod and go yep 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 and it's until we show them the operating system and show them igls it's kind of, it kind of clicks so uh, so while while Chris, you're getting set up, a couple interesting questions came in, and I'll I'll ask one now because I think it's it it would be easy to answer in the context, and the other two I can throw in as we as we go through the UMS. Um, so the there was a question around, um, you know, is there any benefit of using the UD Pocket instead of installing IGEL OS on a VMware machine? And you know, I would say, I'll, I'll take a swing at this one. I would say the, the key here is manageability. So if you look at 
VMware workstation or even putting it in a VDI. Well, if you put it in the data center, then you're, you're trying to use Igil to connect to a cloud scenario. So that, you know, and, and not everybody's going to be technologists like us on the phone and us on, on, on camera right now. So that's where, you know, you remember, we're not catering to technologists, we're catering to um, to end users. And then there was a question around Chromebook and I'll throw that to the, the to Chris, because I guess the question is, can it be installed on a Chromebook? The answer is yes, if it's Intel based, but is it technically supported? And I guess I'll let you answer that. Yeah, well, Chrome has that uh, mode, I think it's called developer mode. So I think every time you boot up on it, it's gonna uh, present you with this, uh, is this a trusted operating system? So there's some, some kind of messaging around that. And and yeah, we've been able to you know plug in the UD pocket and boot up to it, but you have to be in that developer mode. What it comes down to is just a, not a great user experience for the, for the Joe normal user, right? For maybe a technologist or something that just deals with technology every day, but I wouldn't hand that to anybody that is gonna be always asking, you know, what is this thing popping up? There's also a keyboard thing. The Chrome keyboard is is kind of uh, interesting. So uh, officially, I don't think it, we have a list of third-party devices that you know we've officially tested, or even the larger Agile community out there has gone through and done some of their own testing. Uh, Chrome is not one of those on a regular basis that we would say, you know, is is, is rock solid. Cool. All right. So you're gonna show off the UMS in. Couple yeah, I uh, just make sure everybody can see my environment here, my UMS, uh, UMS up on the screen. Just want to make sure of that. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Excellent. So what you've got here is, uh, you know, um, the IGEL, you know, sort of the brains behind everything, right? Our founder, Heiko, who just literally handed over the reins uh, as far as CEO goes to J uh, Jed Ayers, you know, when they found it, IGEL was really about, you know, the internet's going to need an operating system, you know, and, and that's kind of what, what began the idea of, of IGEL. Um, and I don't think anybody knew 20 years ago what we'd be dealing with now, but um, when I first came to IGEL, one of the things that really caught me was this tool you're looking at right now. Uh, I had I was at Improvada and we, we dealt with all kinds of thin client vendors out there. And this really caught my eye and then throw in this new thing that we added probably just a few years ago this IGEL cloud gateway that's what this icon here is and now you've got the ability to manage this device anywhere it's out there on the internet uh, so for me my current scenario is UMS is literally hosted in Azure it's also uh, where I host my ICG so um, built into that uh, into the operating system as an agent you know point me at a, a cloud gateway and then you get it configured now that it's configured um, I can shadow the device uh, over here. Um, if you're familiar with managing Active Directory, then then view this, this these profiles as your group policy settings, uh, controlling some facet, uh, whether it be you know time and date, background, wallpaper, networking, you name it. Um, and then the devices. This is where your OU structure would be, right? This is my directory structure. Where is the device residing? And then, so in my case, my UD pocket is sitting in this directory here. You can see some details about the device. You can also see over here what's assigned to it. Um, so this is really just what comes down to is just basically, you know, an XML, uh, INI kind of, everything gets kind of compiled and then, you know, controls some some facet of that or uh, the device here. now. The device is literally sitting behind me and so I'm gonna pull it up. I'm shadowing it right now. Uh, what's really cool, this is an old laptop, uh, Lenovo laptop that I bought probably about three, three and a half years ago. Um, both my kids needed a, a laptop for school. And at the time it was running Windows 10, an earlier version of it. And then of course, after about a year or so, year and a half, we started getting those notifications. You need to update, get a new version. And uh, it just didn't have enough room to take the new version. Uh, but by then I had kind of come to iGEL and I said, well, I got this pocket, let me try this thing out. And so that's what you're looking at here is a UD pocket running off that Lenovo device. Um, it's a laptop, it's got fully function. I've got wireless wired. Um, I got a webcam on it. Um, and uh, and what I'm controlling here is, you know, being a cloud workspace scenario here, if you, if you go into the local, you know, configuration and setup, you'll see um, what we're controlling at the, uh, at the endpoint. And I'll explain some of uh, this right here in just a second. Um, but this is, uh, 
uh, when I'm creating the configuration of these things, I basically say, what do I want to be able to do here, right? So if I all of a sudden need to spin up Teams real quickly or uh, Office 365, I just go in and I create a profile and I push that setting down. Or if we're rapidly spinning up WVD um, or, or Citrix, you know, hosted, you know, uh, managed desktops, you know, it's just a matter of, of pushing down the configuration setting uh, for that particular uh, you know workflow or, or whatever and so that's kind of what's being controlled uh, behind you here from the UMS all these profiles are coming down controlling that so as I close that out uh, if tomorrow we say hey all right WVD is live um, the user can just access it you know from here or you can make it available through a, a right-click menu option uh, start menu you know you kind of control all of this if you don't want it here, you want it maybe in what's called an application launcher, um, you know, something like this here. I mean, it's just completely up to you how you want to control the user experience. Um, so that being said, I just fire up my WVD connection. And what's really cool here is, is I gel partnered with Microsoft. This is uh, last year in November. Uh, Pete, you were, you were there at the show. Yep, um, yep. I think it was around the time uh, Citrix was celebrating its 30th anniversary, if I, if I have my uh, dates right. Yeah, um, but uh, but we had a big announcement with um, uh, and just to show you, Carl talked about earlier this agile mindset, right? I, literally a year ago at Agile Disrupt in um, uh, in Munich and also in um, uh, out in San Jose, California. Um, that's when this whole conversation with Microsoft started coming. Our Windows VD was coming out, and uh, just through some connections, all of a sudden we got in touch with the folks there. Next thing you know, we parachuted in some developers there to Redmond. And what you're looking at now is, you know, the end result. Here is a the first Linux-based client to get you into a WVD session, uh, be it Windows 7 Legacy or the Windows 10 multi-session. Um, and so. It goes through and makes all these connections, and then there you go, there you go, and this is coming out of a Azure-based environment on the East Coast from from me, um, and that's how quickly we were able to move on this. Uh, a year ago, this was was not even code, nothing, uh, but now it's it's live and it's available, and our version 11.3.500 just came out that has this built in. So. Um, I'm just going to quickly sign out just to kind of show you. So, so Pete, any other Chris, comments? I want, to, I want to rewind you back. So when you get to your desktop, there's a great question that came in from Michael. And Adam, I got your question. I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to come to that too as well. Uh, but he's asking about, you know, the different use cases. So he has in-office endpoints, remote office endpoints, and mobile, you know, sometimes not always connected endpoints. And, and your screen kind of shows off some of the power of what's called a custom partition. So can you kind of oh, yeah. highlight some of yeah. the apps here you have installed? Because this is this is a little, this is the other value of iGel. I, I mean, I've been around iGel now for over 10 years. And, and one of the things I love is, yeah, it's flexible, but it's also locked down. So you're able to do some flexibility to it, but you're able to put teams on there as an example, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great, great point. So uh, we talk about security, right? It, it's not an operating system where you can just go out to any any uh, place and download a Linux-based version of an application and install it. it that that's it's 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 locked down. And and believe me, having sold into the federal government, you know, classified environments and unclass, you know, you can't have something like that. I mean, just it, there's a lot of security around it. But we have a lot of flexibility. And so one of those things is. Um, you have a need for a new driver or maybe there's a Linux based application that is uh, maybe it's cloud accessible perhaps but uh, maybe you also want to run it locally um, and so uh, through our partnerships in the industry and others you know we, we are able to create these uh, customizations if you will um, and install an application so that it runs as if it's locally installed that slide you had up earlier that Carl showed that ecosystem right um, if it's a custom partition, it's not in the firmware. And the idea is simply this, right? I mean, we didn't really talk about it, but you're talking about a, a, what are our requirements? Just two gigs of disk space, uh, two gigs of RAM, you know, that's, you know, 64-bit, you know, that that's really all we require. We, we're not an eight, you know, 10, 12 gig operating system, but you know, the more types of applications you would in, in add into the firmware, it would you know balloon the OS, and so this custom partition says, "Here's our base operating system feature functionality. It's got Citrix and VMware and WVD and all these things built in. But if you have other things, 
like teams, you can add them on. And so I've got partitions that we added on for teams. Uh, this is actually till still tech preview. Microsoft hasn't officially released the final version of this, um, but it is the Linux based version of the Teams application. Um, case in point here, uh, you probably may have seen my son who's, you know, a college student working, uh, taking classes from home, finishing up, you know, and my daughter is downstairs, my wife's a teacher. They rapidly spun up Teams in less than a week so that they could do teaching from home and online learning. Um, and so I anticipated that they might need an emergency UD pocket just in case their current machines aren't working. And sure enough, that actually played itself out in the first week or so. Um, but Teams, Zoom has obviously become very popular. Some would say uh, they're to blame for this whole thing, but uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw that somewhere, a little joke, but, uh, but it is. I mean, you can install it here. Um, and so it just allows you to extend the capability um, of what's already built in. Yep. So Chris, since we're on the topic of kind of management, um, and I had a lot of good questions coming on, and if you got to jump, don't worry. This is going to be the, this is going to be recorded. I'm not going to cut this short because there's a lot of cool questions. Um, but uh, talk about uh, Adam. Adam asked about um, you know remote management, and you guys have this really cool thing called the uh, you know Igel Cloud Gateway. And can you mm -hmm. kind of just highlight that in a nutshell? Yeah. And then Adam, if you want to get deeper. Uh, let me know and I can take you through it. I have it set up and can take you through a simple demo as well. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so the gateway is, um, you know, it, it's basically it's software that runs on a Linux server and we have uh, support for various Linux versions out there. Mine in this case happens to be running on a uh, Ubuntu server in, in Azure. Um, and so you get this thing set up and uh, from a security perspective, um, over here under cloud gateway options you you can create a root certificate or you can uh, go out there and get one signed by some public ca and then uh, obviously get one that you would use for your uh your uh, your azure uh, or your icg in general wherever you host it um it can be hosted in the cloud it can be hosted in your dmz on-prem it really doesn't matter you can have multiple icgs connected to a ums environment um and the way it works is um you know you once you kind of get all that squared away then you go in through the install process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add a new gateway. And uh, okay, I'm going to put this certificate. You know, you go through and click next, and then you know, accept the license, blah blah blah. And then you fill in some details, and uh, and then you get it connected out. I'm oversimplifying it uh, in terms of the the steps. It's really, I'll just say this: in the last three weeks, I've gone through this setup probably ten times. <laughs> it's been very popular. Yeah. So. Um, but it, it, it just, this is the powerful thing that allows you to be able to take that device that maybe was on-prem being managed. Now you can manage completely the entire thing, including firmware updates, right? I mean, if you got a new version of Citrix or a new version of uh, WVD client or whatever it is, and you need to update that device, what's really cool is um, I can host those firmware updates remotely somewhere that they can get to from the internet. And then I can assign an update to this device, and maybe today it's on version 11.3, and I want to update it to 11.3.5. I just assign a profile and say, this is where you go get your update, and bam. Um, and that's really one of the key things, right? You don't want to have the user, uh, I need to install the latest Citrix client or VMware client or whatever client or whatever updated browser. We manage all of that, and that's possible because of the way the uh, ICG works. Yeah, and I'll give a use case that I just recently did. I helped a customer uh, set up uh, 30 IGEL UD2s remotely, and I wasn't even in the room, and they just plugged them into the internet, and I was able to see all the devices, get them all set up, get them firmware updated, and I didn't have to walk in the room and touch any of them, so it was pretty cool. Um, all right, so another question came in around, um, you know, and, and a lot of good questions, so don't, again, if you got to jump, we're, we'll continue to go, and Chris and Carl, if you got to jump, let me know. We can kind of wrap. But um, the uh, around graphics and, and the, the thing that's great about IGEL is the not only the flexibility, but the hardware is as well. So, yes, they happen to sell hardware. But if I install it on a, an existing piece of hardware, it takes advantage of some of the underlying capabilities. So how, how does it deal with graphics and maybe talk a little bit about the codex? And again, um, you know, Adam, uh, definitely feel free to set up some time with us. We can take you deeper. Uh, Apollo, same thing, but yeah, kind of highlight the power of some of the graphics and codecs you guys have built in. 
Yeah, so um, uh, to the slide earlier that Carl showed, right, the operating system we can install on, you know, older hardware, and then of course we have our own hardware. Um, now, when it comes to those advanced graphics and things like that, you know, if you look at our um, our website and you see the actual thin clients we build, our our, our highest end unit is a UD7, and it has, you know, four displays and this like all these, you know, advanced type stuff, and then of course uh, the codex, right? When you are uh, installing the operating system, the base license, this is called our workspace edition, um, has the codex for you know managing that. Now, if I'm repurposing a device or using a UD pocket, then it does come down to what does the endpoint hardware actually support? What can it support? Um, versus this brand new UD3, which is sitting right next to me here. Um, this uh, is uh, gonna be available here shortly for, for uh, release. Um, but I've got a new, uh, the newest version of it, and it actually has built-in advanced graphics support uh, for the different use cases. It's not our highest-end unit, but it is one of our most popular, um, and it's pretty darn powerful. Um, and just to give you an idea, I can shadow the device here, just like the other one, and it'll come up, and you know, you can kind of see various things. So, um, but that being said, you know, built into, I'll just pull up. Um, let me just take a. I go back to my device here. So let's take um, some settings for uh, my Citrix environment or something. I'll just pull up this profile. So as you're building this out, like what's the use case, right? Well, I've got this, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna need HDX multimedia, you know, support, you know, so we've already got all of that built in, you know, including, um, including, uh, you know, here's our codex support, there's uh, uh, deep compression, JPEG, and then I, I'm not gonna get into the, Jet Fighter Pilot version of this today, but um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. One of the really cool things, if you've ever been to one of our Disrupt events, um, and I'm sure we've got this on video somewhere, um, we have one of our engineers uh, who has been working with NVIDIA and uh, Citrix, and basically his, his mission in life is virtual reality over a remote session, true virtual reality, 90 frames per second, and he's figured out how to do it. Um, he was demoing it off of the UD3, which I was just looking at earlier, a second ago. Um, but uh, but re really, any kind of device, if it has that, then you've got that built in. Um, same thing for some of the unified communication stuff built in. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of people asking questions about the webcam for obvious reasons with uh, um, remote working and everything. So, um, uh Talk to Pete, talk to uh, ourselves, whatever, you know, if you have questions about what hardware would support my use case, um, we'll hopefully have an answer for you. All right, so two, uh, I'll ask two more questions and, um, and and then we'll cut back into kind of wrapping this up because I um, cause I know, you know, you guys probably have a hard stop and I want to be respectful of your time. So, and again, I appreciate you guys taking the time. So I can't answer them all, but I get all these questions, by the way, and there is one about how they compare against a certain competitor. Uh, you know, that might be a good offline question, Michael, and I'll, I can maybe put a, we can put some fun documentation around that. Um, but let's see, the one I wanted to ask you, Chris, is someone asked about the status of the web-based GUI. And uh, I, you probably can't say in this forum, but you know, the, the, you know actually I, you know. I can. Oh, you That's can, okay. all right, sweet. Yeah, because I'm, I'm... <laughs> So, uh, so our product management has been uh, working on, and I'm actually part of, uh, this is the beauty of Microsoft Teams, I was added to a group where I have access to a tech preview release uh, to, you know, run through some paces, and, and uh, there's some, you know, some uh, initial common use cases that'll be available for the web UI. I have not yet installed it. Uh, I am actually going to install it in my Azure environment that I've got up on the screen here. Um, but the long and short of it is, uh, it'll you know you log in and you'll be able to do various things. It's not going to be fully functioned. I mean, this what you're looking at here is is you know years and years and years of Java development, and you're trying to port a lot of those functionalities to a web UI. So guess what? We talked about agile product management earlier. I was I, I was the product manager right after Pete after I left in Pravada. He said, "Hey, take my job," and I said, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but. I learned a lot about Agile. I learned a lot about Scrum, the whole bit. And um, uh, but yeah, it's it's coming soon. Uh, it is on the roadmap here, um, and we've already got a tech preview. I don't know what the actual release date is. I would say it's probably going to be an initial version one, a help desk type tool, not not, uh, and they'll add more functionality as time goes on. Sweet. Um, and 
another question came in around, uh, can I install this on a gigabyte small form factor? Apollo, the answer is yes. Uh, if you reach out to me after this call, we can get you set up with a demo and et cetera. And that goes for anybody on the call. And you all will get followed up with at some point in the next few days. So don't, don't worry. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely follow up. And David, thank you for all your uh, testimonials. Uh, appreciate your insight and input. And I'll share it with the IGEL team as well. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. That, all right, I'm going to hand back over to you to kind of do a wrap up and then uh, we'll kind of come to a close on this. But if you have any other questions, please shoot them into the Q&A dialogue because they do get recorded and then we can answer them after the fact. Sure. And we always do a follow-up session, Pete. I think some of you got an opening in the webinar Wednesdays. Let's see you're yep, back in. Definitely, out. definitely. Um, so yeah, so just to, to, to bring it together, right, we talked about how the world's changed and we talked about a new organizational strategy being needed. Um, you know, we provided, I think, some discussion around Agile as something to consider. And then we looked at how that impacts the EUC. So kind of in summation, we look at, you know, IGEL supports this, you know, Agile business transformation from the EUC perspective. Right? We have an operating system that is flexible, robust, and adaptable. Um, you know, we have multiple methods of, you know, purchasing and deploying IGEL to make sure it's financially feasible. Uh, you know, it's a read-only Linux-based operating system. is highly secure, and as as Chris was demonstrating, it's also very easily manageable at scale. So I think that you know, again, I said earlier that I think that one of the key things about technology is that technology needs to work hand in hand with the business to provide you know, align on strategy and then provide the capabilities to execute that strategy. I think IGEL does a really great job and is a really critical component. You know, as we sail into this fog of the future to do that. Um, by way of just a little bit on uh, just some general housekeeping, uh, if you are an existing IGEL customer, I do want to talk about, or not, but I want to talk about uh, a program we've got that launched this week. It's called the Work From Home Kit. And um, what we're offering is an additional IGEL OS license. Uh, we include in that the e, uh, Enterprise Management Pack, which has that Internet Cloud Gateway, the IGEL Cloud Gateway that we just saw, the ICG, a year of maintenance, and a UD Pocket. We're offering that at 50% off of list price if you, you know, for every IGEL license you own today. Um, so every workspace edition license you have, you can buy, you know, essentially this kit to, you know, for folks to work from home at 50% off. If you don't own a workspace edition license, you can purchase one and then get the kit as well. You know, the combined savings is still pretty substantial. So, you know, feel free to reach out to Pete and the, uh, the sales team at Integra. They can get you hooked up with, with quotes on that. Um, the other thing that's really exciting, just from a pure marketing standpoint, is today, Today, we announced our annual um, sweet stakes. So I think that, you know, everyone's, one of the interesting things, everyone went home and we're all like, you know, we've seen funny pictures of people like balancing laptops on ironing boards and trying to figure out how to make that, that workspace work well. IGEL's promotion for 2020 is this, we are offering a home office makeover worth $20,000 um, to, you know, to survey respondents. So, and it's not just that, right? It doesn't just end with a $20,000, um, you know, home office makeover. We're also offering $5,000 quarterly prize packs. So every three to four weeks, you'll be awarding a prize pack worth about five, five grand. We include in there a widescreen curve monitor, an espresso machine, a fancy office chair, a Herman Miller designed office chair for office furniture, um, you know, a laptop, you know, really the works. So there's a lot of ways to win. And if you're an existing customer and you submit to be a testimonial customer, you'll get entered in to win, you know, for a second drawing. So we're doing a second drawing just for customers um, to do a, you know, home office makeover. Uh, so submit your use case. Um, David, I would say that based on what I saw and what you've submitted, you're a great candidate for that one. So how do you enter? Very easy. Go to workspacecoolplace.com. Um, it'll prompt you for a code. Uh, right now you can use the code GERSH. Um, in a few days you'll be able to use the word code Zentegra, but Pete, I will give you everyone obviously that registers on the GERSH code since only people on this call got that code. Um, but really excited about it. The other thing is, is that at the Workspace Cool Place website, we've actually engaged with a woman named Vicki Norris. She's a TV personality seen on HGTV. She's a published author. She's got expertise in not only home office design, but office organization, something that I definitely could use a little bit of help with. And she's going to be providing ongoing content in the form of, you know, quick videos and tips and worksheets on how to turn your home office into a cool place. So, you know, it's not just come and enter the contest. We have a lot of really, really cool content there, you know, to make it a hub, um, you know, for everyone as they're learning to acclimate to, to working from home. So be sure to, like I said, go over Workspace Cool Place, check it out. If you're thinking about workspaces, what I love about this is that it's, it's workspace, like 
your Citrix workspace and also your workspace like your physical area, right? And iGel impacts both of those in terms of in the cool places. So that's my 30 second pitch on that, but definitely check out, go code Gersh to get in. If you forget the code, you can always just you know, hit the chat window and talk to one of us ISRs. Um, but I wanna thank Pete, I wanna thank you very much for uh, you know giving us this opportunity to talk with the crowd and uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a, a chance to uh, come back again. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I, I always enjoy getting you guys on the phone and uh, it's fun. And uh, one other thing I want to make a note of, I don't, you know, we're on camera. You can see I got an awesome t-shirt on by IGEL and it has the word believe. We have, they have the community campaign around just believing and, and staying positive through this, uh, this, you know, unprecedented time. And as, uh, as a result of today, uh, Zentegra is committed to donating uh, $1 for every attendee that attends webinars in the month of April. So we are going to be donating to a organization called directrelief.org uh, that is helping out uh, our front lines uh, of nurses, doctors, first responders, and medical equipment. So, um, and really quickly, you know, how do you get this, uh, you know, uh, thing called IGEL? Well, one, you could go directly, but they love working with Zentegra. Uh, and this is Andy, our fearless leader. Um, but really quickly, before we all exit, you know, definitely reach out to us because we can not only help you get access to Zentegra, but we can also help you implement it. I'm, I mean, me personally, I've, I've helped, uh, I was actually working on a client last night and helping them with an issue um, that they were hitting just a minor thing and I helped them with a new workflow and boom, done, right? So, you know, we, we not only sell you the product, but we help you get it up and running and then we help enable you uh, through these great uh, uh, sessions. And I also do a one day workshop as well. Um, so definitely reach out and if, if you have any questions directly uh, and just for good purpose, I'm going to put our contact information up and ask for one more call for one more question. Uh, and if you have a, a burning question and we didn't answer it, please put it in the Q&A dialogue. But I want to thank uh, Chris and Carl for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to get you guys on the phone and, and hang out and talk technology um, and get some great insight from Carl. I, um, but, and Chris, it's always good to, good to see you as well. Uh, so thank you for taking time to join us. Uh, thank you to the IGEL team for all your support through this uh, this interesting experience right now. And you know what? Let's face it. I don't think this is the last time we'll see this in our lifetime. So we got to be ready for the next time. And, and I think, you know, I really strongly feel that IGEL is a great solution. And again, any questions we couldn't get to, please let us know. So any last thoughts, Carl? Uh, no, no. Although you mentioned the Believe shirt. So everyone on the once a free Believe shirt, just go to IGEL.com slash Believe. Um, you know, go there, you register, and we'll get a shirt, and we do make a donation as well. So yeah, and so what uh, Igel's doing on that front, and is if you take a picture with your shirt on, and you know, it could be anywhere, and you tag Igel and put hashtag believe, they're going to donate one dollar to a charity of your choice. So they have a list of charities that they'll let you pick. So so great, great concept, and I love it. I love working with you guys, and and uh, it's a fun company to work with. So thank you, and Chris, any final thoughts? No, uh, I was just sitting there looking at that picture up on the screen, and uh, that's from my son's Eagle Scout ceremony. So, the, you know, be prepared, right? We talked about earlier, just be focused and be prepared. So if there's anything I learned from that, Scout's motto, be prepared. So start thinking about it now, start planning for it, and let's rock and roll. Yeah, amen to that. So, all right, well, everybody, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for an hour, a little over an hour today, and uh, hopefully you found this valuable. Uh, again, next week we'll be doing webinar Wednesdays. And our guests, uh, we have a double header again. We got Liquid Air in the morning and we got Nerdio in the afternoon. So definitely keep an eye out for those and register today. Uh, and again, look forward to seeing you all in the future. So thanks for taking the time and have a great day.